Hi, my name is uh, Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Uh, Insight is a show where we normally discuss books on politics, both domestically and internationally. Uh, sometimes we look at books on history that provide some insight into the present and sometimes some broader atmospheric or trend analysis books to give you a sense of how certain developments are going to matter in a political environment. Uh, today, we're talking about a book on uh, nuclear weapons. It's written by Vitpin Narang. Uh, who is at MIT, and uh, his book is titled Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era, Regional Powers and International Conflict. Now, joining me on the show today are two Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Bailey Bauer, and to Bailey's right is Alexa Stanley. Now, I wanted to read an opening quote from the book, and that way we can get a sense of where the author's coming from and then jump into a discussion of this book. The author writes, The world has entered a second nuclear age. In this new era, regional nuclear powers will define the proliferation and conflict landscape. These states have small nuclear arsenals or often ensnarled in long-standing rivalries participate in multiple active conflicts and often have weak domestic political institutions. We presently have a poor understanding of these unfolding nuclear dynamics. The superpower model of nuclear strategy and deterrence does not seem to be applicable. Yes, the poor understandings come from the lack of information the superpowers and the regional powers want to give. They don't like to answer questions that give away their arsenal, what it is, how much they have, and what they would do to deter um, com conventional conflict. What we do know is for now they are used for mere existence. Hmm. Along with that, they also focus a lot more on the superpowers than they do the regional powers, just because they're bigger. Um, so if, like Iran, were to get more um, nuclear weapons, basically that would open up even more multipolar like arsenals. Uh, well, the the uh, superpower model, I think uh, he sort of briefly mentions it, but what he's looking at is that you have huge nuclear arsenals. Uh, and so usually you are going to look at these things in a massive retaliatory strike that if you're uh, struck, your force is going to be able to survive and then you're going to be able to tolerate on a massive level. And also you have a great diversity of uh, nuclear weapons. And so as a result, um, what the author of the book is looking at is selected countries, uh, France, China, for example, Israel, Pakistan, India, and seeing that uh, they don't necessarily look at the acquisition of nuclear weapons in uh, this same way, that they're looking more at the idea of maybe not thinking like the model of the United States or the former Soviet Union where you're going to acquire enormous quantities of weapons that might be defined of as long range, hence strategic nuclear weapons or tactical nuclear weapons, uh, small ones or enormous variety, whether uh, being shot from a missile or dropped from a plane or coming from a nuclear submarine. So um, that's the way we had an image of what acquiring nuclear weapons meant because that was how we looked at the United States and the then Soviet Union. But uh, this is sort of saying, well, uh, that image may not be accurate. Yeah, the superpower strategy um, even quotes uh, assured destruction, flexible response, massive retaliation, countervailing strategy, and damage limitation. Um, they were also more military powerful than the other states in the system, and their ability to deter non-power states were overdetermined. Um, one of the other things I think is that um, they, they're sort of, he's sort of suggesting that uh, at times maybe some of the use of nuclear weapons has served to help a country, and so. 
they're referring to a situation here in 1999 where uh, India uh, was maybe successfully kept at bay by uh, Pakistan threatening to use uh, nuclear weapons. And so uh, this might be an odd situation where you're thinking, well, nuclear weapons served a country uh, because it helped them to prevent somebody from uh, succeeding in a military victory sense. I think it's just a, like a major security thing. People use that as almost like a threat, obviously, the whole, like to just deter people from using it on them. And, yeah, uh, Pakistan uh, was attempting to compensate for its numerical inferiority against India by operating on the interior lines of communications. It, its larger neighbor would occur um, across easily, so this condition renders Pakistan extremely vul vulnerable to India. There's this, now it's a, uh, sort of one of those things you get into academics, but he says uh, something he develops called the posture optimization theory and by this he says uh, that existing regional nuclear powers have adopted the nuclear postures and strategy they have and generates testable predictions about what type of nuclear posture future regional nuclear powers might adopt based on a set of observable variables <laughs> and so now he's trying to figure out that, okay, so how do we use this approach to try to take a look at these different countries, whether it's South Korea or China or Pakistan or India or Israel or France, for example, and then you're systematically trying to figure out uh, how they're developing uh, sort of their strategy, meaning how they're thinking of using the nuclear weapons they have and are they planning to acquire more. Right. The, uh, the problem with all these variables is the dangerous assumption that we have with them. Uh, we're focused primarily on their initial acquisition of nuclear weapons, but little thought has been given to what regional powers will do after they get the nuclear weapons. Mainly, the mere existence of nuclear weapons rather than strategy drives this conflict that we have with them. Mm -hmm. um. He has a quote I like. It says, unlike the superpowers, where both develop massive nuclear arsenals capable of everything from tactical first use to counterforce strikes to assured destruction, uh, counterforce strikes means that you're able to precisely target uh, military targets separate from civilian targets. And so again, unlike the superpowers, uh, which both develop massive nuclear arsenals capable of everything from tactical first use to counterforce strikes, first strikes to assured destruction. The regional powers have had to make choices about how and where to allocate their deterrent power. And so that's sort of a main theme of this book is that these countries are more limited and they have to make some very selective choices. Right, the regional powers have very many choices that they need to make and where they need to allocate their deterrent power, but the superpowers, it was all about sequence, targets, and volumes that they already had planned out in their strategies. Go ahead. Yeah, theirs was like all, you know, planned out future events, but these regional powers have to basically rely on just them um, to make it and make it work. This, uh, it's interesting he starts talking about uh, Israel as sort of an example uh, and what you're doing is looking at uh, something such as what they call a patron state and so that some of these powers have sort of a major power over them and the way they might threaten to use their nuclear force isn't necessarily always aimed against an enemy as much as trying to get the patron state, the state to become involved so that in this sense what you're doing is uh, Israel was trying to force the United States to say become more actively involved in the Yom Kippur War of 1973 by saying if the United States wasn't more aggressively involved in getting on their side and giving them what they needed to fight uh, Arab countries, then they might 
drag out their nuclear weapons. And so in that sense, it's sort of an odd use of nuclear weapons. You're threatening uh, someone who essentially is your partner uh, and trying to make sure, okay, now we don't need to use our nukes because you as our partner have come in and joined our side in a much more aggressive, active way. Yeah, Israel in 1973 feared Syrian and Egyptian forces were threatening its own survival, and that's why they wanted to bring U.S. intelligence inside. This way they could do operational checks on delivery vehicles in a manner that was easily detectable, uh, signaling that it was considering um, its opaque nuclear weapons capability. And this is showing that is. Israeli goal was to galvanize that U.S. government into both rearming its military with them to kind of join fo forces so yeah they didn't have to use the didn't have the pressure to use their um, nuclear weapons. So. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, the other point that they're making which is I think very different than the United States and the former Soviet Union is they're saying that these uh, uh, nuclear powers uh, have to have a situation where they're reinforced and protected against conventional strikes so that it isn't sort of that you're always worried about a nuclear force attacking a nuclear force but that you may be worried about a conventional force attacking a nuclear force and so as a result uh, you then want your force to be able to survive a conventional military attack so you can threaten retaliation. And so this seems to be uh, what you're dealing with regarding countries like uh, China and India, uh, this notion that as a result you don't need a lot of weapons, you just want to make sure the ones you have will survive being attacked. Basically just to defend yourself, I mean you're going to need something that's going to survive so you have at least some form of threat if someone's threatening you. Um. This point is uh, reached relatively quickly at, at the regional level since uncertainties and numbers uh, of deployments and how many nuclears are out um, and the delivery system, these, all these numbers and the ways to get them need to be survivable, like you said, and at a low cost and at a very early state in a nuclear program. There's a quote here, uh, the decision to acquire or test nuclear weapons is only one element of nuclear posture. The capabilities that constitute an arsenal and how they are arrayed. We simply do not have a good understanding for why regional powers choose different nuclear postures and strategies. All of the nuclear powers have had at least latent security pressures that drove them to nuclearize in the first place, yet they have chosen different postures, uh, meaning how they're thinking of using or maybe stating that they might use their uh, nuclear weapons. And so uh, in that sense, you're sort of saying, are you going to use it against a conventional strike? Are you going to use it only against if you're struck in a nuclear sense? Are you going to be the first one to use it so you're going to have a first use strike so it, these little, these variations, not little, but major variations are what you're trying to sort of uh, get a sense of. Right, that's explaining uh, that we presently have no systematic theory for why regional powers choose to select the, a nuclear posture that they do. Um, if we could get this information and answer this question, it would be an important advance since the acquisition of nuclear weapons alone does not consent or uniform effect in conflict outcomes. Yeah, like you said, um, obviously there's been some security pressure that's happened that has drove them to nuclearize. We just don't know why. And if we did, that would help a lot of issues, I think. Um, one of the things I think the authors trying to see related to this thing he calls posture optimization strategy uh, is the idea that are we looking at a regional power that has a connection with a patron st uh, state and a patron state is the idea that they have some connection with a larger uh, power so that uh, again Israel having been associated with the United States uh, Pakistan at one time 
having been associated with the United States, China at one time having been associated with the Soviet Union, and so these regional powers sort of felt like they could call upon that major superpower to come to their assistance. Uh, in the case of Pakistan, then uh, they no longer feel the United States is going to come to their aid, and China feels the same way that the Soviet Union fell apart, but that Russia isn't there to come to its aid. And Israel, uh, in the book, I get the feeling it's a question of that changes with Israel, whether or not they feel the United States is actually coming to their aid or not coming to their aid, which is why they want this nuclear force that they're not even admitting that they have. Um, and as a result, we're not quite sure what they're using it for. Right in the book, it um, is a patron for regional power. And a quote that I found that best described this is, a patron might be compelled to intervene on its behalf and act as a decisive external balancer. It should select a catalytic uh, posture since it can benefit from the third party patron assistance without having to fully face the complications of managing an overt nuclear arsenal. Basically, ma being the balancer and the person that can help tame what is there. Yeah, I mean, a third party patron is obviously like a huge opportunity for a regional power because they don't have a lot of like opportunities so if they have that security or protection of that but you're also the balancer you have to choose when you want to act and when you don't so and this so the distinction with some states having this patron and others sort of going it alone has some impact on maybe the nuclear posture they're choosing it's uh, interesting how the book uh, doesn't have anything on North Korea uh, and so then as a result, maybe you're trying to figure out how to use the book to gain some insight into how, what nuclear developments are taking place in uh, North Korea. Uh, and so as a result, sort of in one technical aspect, uh, he was talking about the differences between what they call liquid fuel and solid fuel missiles. And liquid fuel uh, has to take hours to load onto the missile before you're using it. So in that sense, you're going to have the missile exposed because you're filling it up. And so as a result, in that situation, you may not be using it as a retaliatory strike because you've already been struck. So you may be only wanting to use it in a first strike situation. Also, your missile isn't quite as mobile, able to be moved around with liquid fuel. It's more combustible, but solid fuel means that it can stay with the rocket. Liquid fuel is more corrosive, so that as a result, you can't leave it in the rocket because it will eat away at the rocket parts. Solid fuel can be left with the uh, missile, and as a result, you can leave it for a retaliatory strike or you can move it around in a more mobile sense so that it seems like what you want is you want to have these countries certainly move to uh, get to solid fuel system as opposed to a liquid fuel system. And so I know that when I was reading articles on the missiles that uh, North Korea has been testing, uh, some of the initial articles were talking about that it looked like they had a liquid fuel system in North Korea. Now they're saying it's solid fuel, which is what we would certainly prefer for them to have. It's ironic we say we don't want them to have nuclear missiles, but at the same time, uh, you, you don't want them definitely not to have liquid fuel missiles, but you'd prefer they have solid fuel missiles. So. Uh, but this was a point that was being uh, developed through the book and that they, each of these uh, countries seemed to be going through some of that evolutionary development. Yeah, the states with no patron basically have to obtain its own security. Mm -hmm. They have to oper operate with its nuclear posture that is in the best interest of its immediate security and the environment surrounding it. The, the security environment that is determined is also with respect to the nuclear power and their capabilities that they have. 
The uh, other thing that they're looking at, which the United States versus the Soviet Union, since we were so geographically distant from each other here, uh, terrain and territory seem to matter, so that the closeness of Pakistan to India or India to China or China to India, so, so you're looking, or Israel related to uh, countries in the Middle East, so that uh, issues dealing with the closeness you are and your terrain seem to also have an impact on your, how you're looking at the development of your nuclear arsenals, which is something that you don't take into account when you're looking at the United States uh, versus, say, the then Soviet Union during what would have been the Cold War era. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, for Pakistan, it's extremely vulnerable to India, and it's also, India is buffered against China's larger conventional land, so putting them all together, they really have to look at the security around their environment, and um, between the two neighbors, they, they fight, so they need to be aware of their surroundings at all times to determine what nuclear posture that they need to have. Uh, and then another factor is what he's saying is civil-military relations, so that while we in the United States have a certain way we're looking at the relationship of civilian leadership over the military, uh, what he's suggesting is that in some of these countries, uh, and I think mainly he means specifically Pakistan, there's a feeling that the military uh, may have more of a control than the civilians and so that as a result you're looking at this sort of relationship with China, uh, then looking at more of a Communist Party control over the military. Uh, India, they were looking at trying to figure out whether or not over time civilians have gained more control over the military, and so then there it was more of a development. Yeah, um, India is a more democratic state that exhibits like civil military relations. Pakistan has been an authoritarian state um, that do not support civil military relations, so I think that's that problem. Yeah, the book uh, describes civil, civil military relations be, being as if you don't have to demand nuclear weapons. Mm. It, they need to have strategic, strategic assets that should be under central control both during peacetime and in crisis. So you don't always have to re... Um, go back, fall back on the biggest, baddest weapon. You need to have other controllable um, assets when going into these conflicts. The uh, opening quote in the chapter on Israel I sort of found interesting. He writes, Israel is the world's oldest closet nuclear state. For more than 40 years it has neither confirmed nor denied its possession of nuclear weapons and has vowed not to be the first to quote-unquote introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East with the definition of introduce being left intentionally vague. But it has circulated enough credible rumors and hints that it does possess a nuclear weapons capability to lead most of the world to believe that Israel was the world's sixth nuclear power. And then they refer to, in 2006, the then Prime Minister uh, said Israel was on the list of uh, nuclear weapons. He says aspiring to have that Iran was sp aspiring to have nuclear weapons as France, America, Russia, and Israel. And then so right after he made that statement, the Israelis said that was a misquote even though he said Israel had nuclear weapons. So it's interesting how you know you sort of have a development of we've got nuclear weapons but we don't have nuclear weapons yeah as stated before like the mere existence of having them is just a power play so to keep the question out there keeps everybody on their toes in an inst uh, in a way so not everybody knows that hey we have all these nuclear weapons and then in the case of China, they're talking about Mao, that they were developing nuclear weapons under him, and Mao is sort of saying, well, we don't need all that many. We just need enough to feel like we can threaten someone else in a deterrent sense because uh, we still have conventional weapons. And so as a result, China is 
looking at things from that point of view that they don't need to develop the massive nuclear arsenals that the United States has had or uh, the Soviet Union had. So uh, again, you have these different perspectives on how you're looking at uh, what, what you need. And so I, I guess, I, again, I think of it in terms of the book is helpful to ask questions about how, what we're looking at regarding North Korea. We're saying we don't want them to have nuclear weapons, but uh, there may not be a lot we can precisely do to prevent it, but then that doesn't mean we know what type of nuclear force North Korea would necessarily want to develop. Right, what you said with China, it ties in with another topic in the book called the techno technological capacity of what they have. And a great quote from this that I, um, that I found interesting is, depending on the capabilities and resource endowment of the adversary, it can be tremendously technically and operationally difficult as well as prohibitively expensive to erect and maintain all these nuclear weapons. So it's not just a power play. They have to make sure that they have the technological advances to make sure that it works when they want to use it and not blow up their own country in a malfunction. And also they have to have the money to build it. Okay. We only have a few minutes left. So uh, what do you think of this book and do you recommend it to readers? I'd say it's very informational of knowing about nuclear weapons and how it's not always about blowing up another country as much as it is a power play and how the strategic postures and the different um, strategies they have and with each patron and if they don't have a patron, it really ties everything together to have a broad understanding of the nuclear strategy. I liked it. I think it was very informative, um, reading about the author's theories. Uh, I think put in a different perspective and about what like the real reasoning for being a nuclear power is and also reading about the regional powers and then the superpowers and the dilemma between those two I think really was informative. Yeah, I uh, think it's a good book. It's it's uh, going to be difficult for people that don't always have a background to get okay, through. I understand mm -hmm. that um, because this is a field that I've uh, done a lot of uh, writing on. So. Uh, and, I, and I know it's not easy to sort of pick it up. It's, uh, it's useful, though, because it starts to give you a sense of understanding. I mean, we are looking at, we are trying to prevent Iran from getting uh, nuclear weapons where you don't want to see the development in uh, North Korea. But the book provides some insight to think, well, it isn't just you get nuclear weapons and stop there that in a broader sense you're looking at what type of nuclear force are you acquiring, then what are you saying you're going to do regarding how you use them. So it provides very good background. So thank you for joining us today.